We'll switch uh, continents now and, uh, and uh, switch across to Asia. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Michael Whitehead, who's the Director of Global Agribusiness Research at the ANZ Bank, uh, as our next speaker. Uh, Michael's had a BA, got a BA from La Trobe, an MBA from Melbourne and the Rotterdam School of Management and also completed the Harvest, Harvard uh, Advanced Agribusiness course, which, uh, which a lot of people in Australia speak very favourably of. In his current role, he focuses on mapping industry-based trends and analysing the impact of these changes and the dynamics on stakeholders across the agribusiness sector. He was a product specialist previously for Macquarie Agricultural Funds Management in New York, as well as executive director of Rabobank's Food and Agribusiness Advisory Team in North America. He's also worked with the United Nations and the International Red Cross in Switzerland, as well as in regional economic development in Australia and China. So to appraisers of developments, uh, particularly in Asia, please welcome Michael Whitehead. Like David Sackett said before, who was that you were talking about? Um, you should replace it with the worst footballer ever to come out of Western Victoria. Um, and an ex-sheep and cattle farmer, and some of you will identify with this and you will have heard me say it before at different things. You remember those days when you are drenching sheep in sort of 38 degree heat and the dogs get pissed off and go home and you have a fight with whoever you're in the, the yards with and you get sick of that or you're trying to, working with cattle in five degree heat and or balls in the yards and all they want to do is kick you to death and you think I'd rather not be doing this and I'd rather do something easy like banking. And you get into banking for a while and you really miss sheep and cattle. Um, it's, uh, it's an honour to follow on from um, Marcelo, particularly in putting what is a very complicated topic into what I thought was a very accessible form. Um, and it's also an honour to follow on from this morning's session. I, I thought that was a, a fantastic session. I think David Sackett's just stepped out, but um, I, I thought that what David talked about um, particularly put so many issues of corporate agriculture into context, it would be good if corporate agriculture from that presentation was back on the front of the Fin Review for the second week in a row. Uh, for those of you who didn't read the front of the Fin Review the other day, ask the person next to you. Um, in terms of uh, also thanking the AFI to Mick and Adam and Kylie and the, the rest of you, uh, thank you for inviting us here today. We're a proud sponsor at ANZ. We think you do amazing world-class work on agricultural research and being asked to speak here is like being asked to go to Eric Clapton's house and play guitar. Um, the other thing that uh, I'll, I'll spare you the ad on ANZ and what we do, but I'll do that on the condition that the Rabo guys, the NAB guys, Westpac and CBA also spare you the ad. Um, today's topic that I wanted to talk about was, uh, well, that I've been asked to talk about, was funding of agricultural models uh, in Asia. Um, when Adam Tomlinson rang me a few weeks ago, I was uh, suffering from jet lag in New York. Me and my friend Jay Horton from Strategist Partners sitting over there. We're in New York at the Global Ag Investing Conference. I don't think anybody else here in this room was there. Um, and the reason I raise that is not just to boast about my work travel budget, but also to say that what leads on from what was happening in New York the other day, where Jay and I sat in a room with three and a half trillion dollars of assets under management, and where the talk in that room was about, and these conferences started up the Global Ag Investing ones in 2008, the first one, um, after the Americans discovered ethanol, the price of corn went through the roof, the price of all commodities followed, there was sudden thought on how institutional capital was going to get into agriculture, and these conferences started. What was a telling sign, and this was discussed this morning, and I'd encourage questions at the end on this rather than what I'm going to talk about, was very clearly the message coming out of there was after six years the largest source of global capital going into agriculture, and that is coming off Park Avenue, coming out of the US, is finally comfortable, this is simplifying it, finally comfortable with putting a certain amount of its assets into agriculture, and it has become comfortable by investing in the US. And the place it is now looking is particularly at Australia, and for those Australians of us who were there who are involved, the level of questioning that we received um, over that event and have been subsequently would lead you to believe that the flow of capital about to come into Australia uh, very much uh, 
in, in a due diligence, we're in a period of due diligence, um, but that is about to grow larger than perhaps a lot of us realise. And the issues of where that goes in terms of production assets, where it goes in terms of management, um, where it goes in terms of how it structures itself uh, is something we need to, to talk about. But that's, uh, that's not what I'm up here to talk about. Um, Adam Tomlinson rang me in New York and uh, said, could I come and talk at this conference? I said, fantastic, be delighted to. Shall I talk about uh, the Indonesian beef modelling we've done about how to restructure that country's beef industry? He said, no, don't. Um, I said, can we talk about the modelling we've done on how Australia's grain infrastructure could uh, increase efficiency by 29% uh, and how that investment would flow in? He said, uh, shut up, big ears. What I want you to talk about instead is uh, how Asian multinationals are restructuring their, their debt and their corporate structures and how this uh, basically compares to Australian ones going forward. Um, so what uh, we wanted to look at in particular over a few minutes is uh, li like a, a TED talk. In a way, for those of you who know TED talks with minimal slides and exciting data, I'd like to use a lot of slides and some pretty boring data to look at these structural overviews, how these companies diversify by currency, by their funding instruments, uh, their working capital management, and, and uh, also at the end, a brief look at some financing models and cases for, um, rather than the multinationals, the Australian versus Asian ones, uh, the farming uh, models, particularly in developing countries. The data I'm going to use today is to look at a, a number of companies, and I'll explain this shortly. What we've done is we've mapped out some Australian companies, the data, particularly their capital structures. From Australia, um, the publicly available data. Um, for those of you who can see, and once again, everybody at the back will get a copy of these sent out, but what we've mapped out is from Australia, Graincore, AACO, Warnable Cheese and Butter, Bega, Elders. Uh, New Zealand, we have Fonterra. And then as Asian uh, comparisons, Olam, Wilma, uh, Centauri uh, out of Indonesia, Noble out of Hong Kong, and now in a way you could say uh, China as well, uh, CP Foods out of Thailand, uh, Heilongjiang Agricultural Company out of China, who now have uh, notable interests in Western Australia, and to, to go across Asia, Advanti, which is a, a major Indian uh, agribusiness company as well. What this very colourful slide tells you, um, and I'll, I'll uncomplicate it in a sec, um, it's particularly, as it says, looking at the capital structures uh, of these companies. So basing out the, their reserves in, well, their structures in terms of cash, in terms of receivables, infantry as well. The big issue that stands out from this is how the Australian companies here on the left uh, particularly uh, have a far greater component of equity in terms of their debt financing or in terms of their debt structures um, than Asian companies. But let's look at it another way. If we take uh, the key players in Australia and New Zealand, and I need to emphasise two things. One, these are, this is taken from publicly available data, so it's not an ANZ comment on any of these particular companies. It's just downloading data over a period of time. And two, it's, it's a sample set, so it's not indicative of, of the whole industry. But if we compare those key players in Australia and New Zealand um, versus those key players in Asia and the trends that we've seen from 2007 up until 2013, 2014, in particular we're seeing uh, changes in long-term debt. In 2007, uh, sort of around the time the global financial crisis was about to hit, you could argue that the Asian companies were below their optimal long-term debt levels, where, on the other hand, Australia was above, Australian companies were above their optimal long-term debt levels, uh, and starting at that period to face concerns about their growth. What we see now from a model like this, uh, and the sample set, uh, just to explain, takes in, in all the figures, so it gives that overall average. Um, that the Australian companies, interestingly, are less leveraged than the Asian companies in this sample. Um, and if we, uh, we took a screening of all global agri companies for which the figures are available, and that's showing that, that leverage over that period of time has generally gone up, um, a sign particularly, you'd say, of the growing sophistication of the sector and also, on the other hand, the growing understanding of the capital providers into that sector. Another big uh, telling figure into why, or a factor into why the Asian figures have changed would be that uh, a lot of the new capital coming out of, uh, out of other parts of the developing world is looking for growth and is likely to put it, uh, more likely to put it into Asia than into their own regions. Um, and uh, more of those uh, developing multinationals are going into Asia. Let's, uh, let's look at it for another way which will wake up all the accountants who might have been drifting off in the room. 
Um, and that's particularly to map out um, debt to EBITDA levels and debt to capital levels. What this emphasises, as we've said there, is that Australian companies, in comparison to Asia, the large Asian agri companies, are going to have uh, more conservative a leverage profile. Where you want to be is obviously, uh, particularly in Australian banking terms or in Australian company terms, in that lower left-hand corner. Ideally, you want to be there. This shows, as I said, that Australian companies are more conservative and are using left, less debt. Uh, anecdotally, you'd say that uh, any, uh, if you're above a level of three for, say, your debt to EBITDA, uh, that funding is going to get into interesting territory if you're seeking bank funding in Australia. The fact that the Asian companies and the scale shows are much larger than this uh, is particularly a factor, um, but they also have a much higher cost, cost of debt, which we'll look at shortly. Uh, this just particularly emphasises that previous slide, the difference uh, between the two in those uh, debt to EBITDA levels. Let's take a look at it, uh, another particular factor there in comparing uh, Asian, uh, Asian agribusinesses to Australian ones. And a look at this raises that big controversial question that we've all been getting at these seminars and in, uh, in discussion of Australian ag for a while. And I think this raises that global champion uh, question that comes up a bit. Because what we've done here is indicate uh, which uh, companies uh, do their debt in their, their currency of issuance, which is not necessarily the currency of their own country. All the Australian ones here have their currency in Australian dollars. Fonterra, obviously, in New Zealand dollars. But we see that Wilma, uh, its uh, currency of issuance is US dollars. Uh, and we also see that for Noble out of Hong Kong as well. The, the dots in here are the relative sizes of the revenue, just to once again give you an idea of the scale of the Australian ones compared to the scale of the New Zealand and the, the Asian ones as well, some of those. So what do we see particularly for those that uh, may have, uh, for some of them who may have a, a debt issuance in a different currency? Possibly the, the first thing to note um, is that if you are issuing a currency, normally you'd want to match your debt with your revenue currency. So if your debts need to be predominantly settled in US dollars, then it's going to push you to get US dollars. So we see that, as I said, Wilmar and Noble are both reporting in US dollars, which is likely to be the currency, obviously, of many of their contracts, which is another sign of their global influence. Uh, and as I say, it goes back to that discussion on how do the Australian ones compare. Um, what percentage of the Australian businesses uh, is offshore compared to the Asian businesses. Let's look at it another way. Um, if we look particularly at the, the debt breakup of the, in, of the uh, instrument, debt breakup by instrument, um, and look particularly at that uh, use of revolving credit facilities by the Australian companies. The big difference here would be, as you can see, that Australian use of commercial paper, uh, short-term debt for meeting short-term liabilities. The Asian companies uh, from this have greater use of long-term loans, uh, much longer term. The implication for this comes back to an idea of government support uh, versus lack of government support, government support for Asian companies. When Australian companies seek debt, they have no uh, government support in so many ways. They have to rely on their fundamentals, such as their own credit with banks, uh, their S&P and their other ratings. Um, other things to draw from this is that the scale of the Asian companies in the sample, as I said, is incredibly large compared to so many of the Australian ones. And it might be easier for them, therefore, to access uh, the capital markets for term loans. The other thing is that the Asian companies have a higher proportion of goodwill and long-term investments. So they might be using more long-term loans and, and bonds to fund themselves. But let's, uh, let's have another look at it. And this chart particularly, when we look at that working capital intensity, this you could call the supply chain chart. Um, and a chart that shows how supply chains have been changing and becoming more sophisticated over time up until now. Um, so if we look at these working capital uh, comparisons, it's clear that there is little difference in this chart between uh, the Asian and the Australian companies. Their globing wor global working capital management is reasonably similar. Um, it's symptomatic of the rise of global risk products uh, and of inventory risk. So essentially when you've got a high volume, uh, stable demand environment, most of these firms have restructured their inventory risk. It used to be preferable for so many firms, and you all know this, to have high inventory. Most of them are now looking to be as close to liquidation as possible, and they're all moving to that concentrated point. Um, that outlier, this is something I need to remove, that outlier of AACO out the end, uh, some of the data downloaded itself uh, the wrong way, and when I, 
put the version that I send out to everybody, we will correct that one. The final comparison in terms of comparing Australian companies to the Asian companies um, is to look at the ownership breakup, particularly within these companies. And what we're seeing, particularly once again on the right, um, in the grey, is uh, if we look at, uh, and once again, I apologise to the people down the back. I, I should have been explaining this to you. I think, Mick, when we come back here next year, everyone in the room will have an iPad um, and everybody won't be looking at a screen but on their iPads watching all of this. Uh, that's just one of my little technological forecasts. Um, you see particularly the grey in this um, is private corporations' involvement in the ownership of companies. And we see how that is far more preponderant in the, uh, in the Asian companies on the right. What's one of the things we can draw from this, um, as it appears to be the major difference there? It, it's possibly that um, we're seeing very different levels of reporting obligations uh, for a number of the Asian companies um, to their particular government bodies, to their particular shareholders as well, and the impact that comes out of this. And uh, for the other side of looking at that, if we look at that institutional ownership breakup, um, particularly we, we see reasonable similarities across, uh, across these. Uh, some have special circumstances such as elders, um, but the role of traditional investment managers in the institutional breakup once again leads to, as we say, that increasing sophistication of the Asian companies over time compared to the Australian ones. Let me finalise on that part just before finishing on the, the farming models with some key points which come out of this. That the Australian companies are less leveraged compared to the Asian companies that most of the companies here issue debt in their reporting currency, although the handful of Asian ones we talk about have some debt in foreign currency, that for the Australian companies, the major source of funding is that revolving credit facility rather than tapping capital markets, um, that that uh, high networking capital, the short-term debt for the Australians indicates um, the, that, what, that while the proportion's on the lower side for the Asian players, the Australians use a long-term source of finance to fund their working capital requirements. But particularly, if anything, um, basically it talks about that growing confidence, that sophistication in the Asian agri-companies. The last thing uh, to talk about, going from the institutional side, uh, to talk about farming models. And in brief, we were asked to highlight a, a few different ways of looking at models for um, basically looking at farming, uh, funding farming models in developing countries, so particularly in Asia, um, but also we looked at some of the others in the developing world as well. I won't go into to too much detail on this at the moment um, because it's probably more of interest than rather of, of relevance to, to so many of the Australian models. But what we basically did in pulling this together in brief was we compared to some innovative models. These, these farmers in the informal sectors, for those of you who've worked in other, these regions, know that these smaller farmers, they're not covered by financial infrastructures. Um, the financial institutions in their region, regions just aren't going to have much of a local presence. And that makes it really challenging for a small developing country farmer to, to get any kind of credit risk. So what we're seeing with these new structures, these innovative structures, is that they're mobilising more of the resources out into the agri-sectors, they're getting more private institutions out there, they're getting more partnerships between stakeholders um, and the private sector's coming in more. Also governments are playing less of a role but creating more public-private partnerships. What we've listed here on the left, uh, the small direct holder lending, the, the standard example. But the new structures that we're seeing emerging in Asia, for example, um, the, whether we're talking about the, the farmer-based organisations or the co-ops, and what that's meaning for developing country farmers and Asian farmers saving on the costs of the creditworthiness assessments and the loan administration for the individual farmers, um, and how uh, basically the security of those is enhanced by, um, by the cash collateral requirements at the organisation level rather than the farmer level. If we look particularly at looking at the emerging farmers in some of these regions, uh, these might be farmers up to about 100 hectares. They might only be cultivating 15 to 20 hectares in different parts of the world. Um, they particularly might lack land title, which would be a big issue in so many parts of the world. Um, but the multilaterals and increasingly some of the outside banks are looking at ways of working with them. And on the last one of the farmer models, savings accounts too, being used as part of a security package. Um, if we look at the collateral models in brief, uh, models where movable assets are a secondary repayment source, the challenges for these have been in the past investments such as irrigation, whether it's replanting of permanent crops, cocoa, cashew trees as well, 
um, the issue of providing seasonal working capital loans to these small to medium enterprises. So the funding of these has been problematic in the past. But now what we're seeing is the multilaterals are getting more interested in long-term funding to the local banks. Um, but the issue of whether the, the, the multinationals are, are concerned about that long-term funding being in US dollars and a, a risk of the mismatch of local currency down to that level. So some of the changes we're seeing is that uh, multilateral funding being in, in local currency. The, the second last one is to look at the buyer approach, the tradi traditional buyer approach. And we've highlighted some of the models with different levels of risk. Um, basically, we're talking about your supply chain uh, funding model, but for the smaller farmers. Value chain financing on the business relationships in the value chain, so the flows between the actors in, in, the, in the value chain. The downside of these is the dependence by the farmer on the single buyer particularly. Um, if the supply chain collapses, it takes the, the farmer and the farmer repayments with it for the bank. Um, but the advantage is the farmer hardly needs any working capital and the income becomes more predictable. So, to, I, I suppose in looking at this, to, to wrap up with some points that come out of that in terms of a very quick look at uh, farming model structures in Asia. And it's something we've worked with particularly in ANZ if we are with our presence in Asia, if we're working with Indonesian dairy farmers up through a cooperative level, up through a multinational level. If we're looking, uh, and dairy is uh, quite a dominant one, but in Chinese dairy farmers up through a cooperative level as well. Um, if we're working uh, with growers, particularly in India, um, as some of the investment laws change there. What are the messages we're seeing? that we are rapidly seeing these new structures evolving. The role of government is minimising. Government in a lot of these countries realises that it does not have the funds to do this long term. And you're seeing this in some quiet, uh, quiet announcements such as the Chinese government's ones that may come out between the lines in the, in the five year plans or some of the ones they put out in February. You are seeing a continuing need for the multilateral organisations, uh, some of the NGOs like the IFCs to be there. You're seeing bank provided capital in these markets growing, but it's almost entirely domestic at the moment, but that's changing. And the last thing is you're seeing the foreign banks, such as ANZ and some of Rabo and some of the others, enter these markets at a multinational level, like the multinationals we talk about. But what they're now seeing, that uh, they're developing different structures and expertise at a farming level. It's both advantageous for them over long term to back the good local farmers in developing countries. It's advantageous politically for them to be involved with these local farmers and they will gradually increase their role in those segments. Um, the people with uh, very good eyesight on the back row can uh, read the disclaimer. But uh, look, thank you for your time on that. Encourage any questions at the end on, on this or on global ag investing and uh, look forward to being with you for the rest of the conference. Thank you.